The Deep End team acknowledges the traditional owners of the lands on which we work and live, pays respect to elders past, present and future, and recognises the importance of Indigenous knowledge to informing public debate. The role that we as artists have in this country called Australia rests on the on the backs of you know tens of thousands of years of art making practice in, in an infinite number of different variations in this place. Our guest today on the deep end is Paul Grabowski. Paul Grabowski is executive director of the Monash University Performing Arts Centres. As a pianist, composer, arranger and conductor, he is one of Australia's most distinguished artists and has written scores for more than 20 feature films in Australia, the UK and the USA. He is founder of the Australian Art Orchestra and has won four ARIA awards, two Helpman awards, several Bell awards and a Deadly award. He was the Sydney Meyer Performing Artist of the Year in 2000 and Artistic Director of the Queensland Music Festival from 2005 to 2007 and the 2010 Adelaide Festival. He was appointed as a Vice-Chancellor's Professorial Fellow in the Monash School of Music in July 2012. In this interview, Paul discusses his engagements through the Australian Art Orchestra with the Yung or Manukau tradition of public ceremonial song from East Arnhem Land. Manukau series are performed to lead the structure of Yung or Bungal or public ceremonies. Its main instruments, other than voices, are bilma or paired sticks and yiraki or didgeridoo. Uh, Paul, wonderful to be talking to you again. Wonderful to be talking to you, Marcia. So I'm here with Aaron and we've all known each other for a long time. Uh, and we adore your music uh, and your personality. So, uh, Paul, tell us a bit about your involvement with Indigenous Australians. My first clear memory of you, I, I mean, I know I'd seen you a lot before that, but I saw you in the Darwin Festival in the Botanic Gardens in a wonderful yeah. show with um, Ruby Hunter. And yep. I think the Wilfreds were there that night. <laughs> it was so beautiful. And we had a little chat afterwards. Uh, and that was a very long time ago. So tell us about your in, how, how you met Indigenous Australians and how you became involved musically with such superstars. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, great question. It, it's really, there's two aspects I think, to the work that I've done with Indigenous Australians. Um, the first aspect, which slightly predated my work with uh, the Nuka community, started with Uncle Archie Roach and Auntie Ruby Hunter. And that began in 2002 uh, when I approached uh, Archie to consider doing a project with the Australian Art Orchestra. And um, in his taciturn way, he said, well, I'll, I'll have a think about it. And then I went to see him perform at the Brunswick Music Festival and listened to that beautiful flow of his music from one song to another, which really had a riverine kind of feeling to me. And, um, of course, and Ruby was very much a part of that. So when we spoke the next time, I said, would you consider... Uh, the river as being a theme in that uh, collaboration that we might do. And again, he he referred that back to, to Ruby because, of course, she was in every sense of the word a riverine person. She was born in the river uh, in a traditional kind of way uh, in, the, in the Murray River. And um, that became the basis of that collaboration, which, you know, lasted for many years the last stage of which, after Ruby's passing, was um, the album that I produced for Archie, which accompanied his memoir called Tell Me Why, um, and led up to the very last concert that we did, which was with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra at the Maya Music Bowl. So that was a, 
a big relationship in my life and in terms of my engagement with uh with his journey and his story uh, and ruby's story that was my introduction into the tragedy of the stolen generation the work with the um with the nooka community as aaron will recall started uh, a little later than that in 2004 uh, my friend stephen teakle uh, took me down to Nuka um, because I had always, for many years prior to that, expressed a deep interest in uh, wanting to connect with what was essentially the oldest extant musical tradition on the planet. And it was a mystery to me why we didn't kind of connect with it more uh, as a nation. I know that with with uh, the work done with the Yotha Yindi mob and Yakala, ma massive steps had been made, a huge leap forward uh, in introducing the whole idea of Yongnu uh, customs and tradition into the modern mainstream. But I was really interested in the ceremonial music itself, not from an ethnomusicological point of view, but simply from a musical point of view. I was fascinated to know what it was. And um, when I finally got the opportunity to go there, it was really interesting because within minutes, literally minutes of arriving, I'd met Benjamin uh, Wilfred and Roy Wilfred. And it seemed to me that in a very short space of time, I was sitting in one of those dongers with those two men and they were playing me the, the Joe Wolper and Manike cycle. And it was one of the most moving experiences I've ever had. It was the force and power of this music was so extraordinary. I'd never heard anything like it. I didn't know anything like that even existed in the world. And I, I just thought to myself, why doesn't everybody know this? This is the most amazing thing. Um, so then, you know, we started to work together and uh, during that process of working, I started to understand by degrees, and, and Sam Kirkpatrick played a huge role in this because he had already been engaging with, with this culture um, and he was able to really help to explain it, particularly in his book about it, uh, Singing Bones. But I understood that in being allowed to perform Manike, in being given the permission to be part of that, irrespective of what we Ballander brought to the table musically, it was immediately accepted that that was part of the Manike. That the Manike is this kind of, it's an organic expression of the interconnectedness of all things. And it's a way of expressing that uh, through music. Of course, the music is a part of a larger ceremonial group of, of, of activities, um, which also involve dance. But this other very important aspect of it, which is its relationship to time, in the sense that it consists of extremely compressed, highly energized, and highly constructed musical moments, followed by improvisatory, what they call head voice or head music, um, improvisations which can continue for a considerable period of time. And they also include large tracts of silence in which daily life goes on. So this, all of this together was, you know, one of the, the big revelations in my life. It, it opened up an entirely new way of thinking about music, an entirely new way of thinking about the relationship of music just to life in general. And then I started to, to understand that there were parallels in other kinds of music that I knew and loved, which I was able to draw references to and from. Um, the work continued over many years and it, it, it goes on. So my relationship now to the sort of next generation 
uh, with Daniel Wolfred and and David Wolfred um, is still very much a part of my life. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for it. So your interest in the music of Australia has taken you from Victoria and uh, South Australia uh, to the Northern Territory where Ngooker is on the, uh, the Gulf of Carpentaria on a river and you've come across all of these styles of music and very different peoples. It must have occurred to you uh, in working with the musicians that you have worked with, and there are many more, of course, uh, that uh, there's a great diversity of peoples uh, in Australia, that, you know, Indigenous people aren't just Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, that there are many peoples, many traditions and cultures, and that uh, sometimes they're very, very different from each other. So uh, that must have been quite the learning curve for you. The whole thing has been a learning curve, and I hope it never stops being one. I can't possibly imagine that it will. Um, absolutely, Marcia. Uh, this continent that we now call Australia was the home for many, many different language groups, um, many of whom, of course, interacted in all kinds of fascinating ways. But as with the rest of the world, very uh, related to and dependent on the ecological situation in which they lived. So there were people who lived in the temperate zones, in the tropical zones, in, in the arid desert zones, and completely different people, completely different uh, ways of existing, ways of expressing uh, the meaning of life. You can see it in the vast diversity of visual art, uh, which comes from these people around the country. Uh, and of course, you know, because of the, uh, the tragedy uh, of the colonial history, a lot of it, particularly from the Tasmanian perspective, a lot of the original kind of expression of that has been buried. So uh, I think the great task ahead is to uh, bring as much of it back into our understanding as possible and learn really, as you say, uh, more about just in how incredibly diverse it was. I mean, there are so many things that we have might have been able to learn from our original people uh, that would have been so useful in, in, in coming to inhabit this place. Um, what I have learned from my work, particularly with the two different strands that I, I was talking about, was that underlying all of the propositions of uh, Aboriginal people is a sense of of generosity that that there is um, that sharing is not something that you do out of altruism. It's something which happens as a kind of basic necessity of life, and um, you know, in in living in harmony with land, and in therefore, which is a corollary of that, living in harmony with other people who are also living in harmony with land, you have a far more integrated sense of person with place. Mm. And therefore, all the expressions of that relationship are very meaningful expressions. And this is such an important piece of very basic wisdom, which now in the 21st century is more important than ever, I would have thought. So Aaron studied Manukau, uh, the song tradition from up there in Arnhem Land, and I'm going to hand over to Aaron uh, to ask some more musically informed questions that I am capable of. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia, and thanks, Paul. No, I'm scared. <laughs> no, 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 no. I no, I'm I, I'm I'm fascinated by all of this and the way you express it because, of course, there's a very you know technocratic understanding of these kinds of music that's possible, and of course, you know, you could point at a lot of literature that you know, exists in academic circles and goes not much far beyond that. And you'd say, well, you know, these people in their music are some of the most studied peoples and musics in the entire world, so why don't we know about it? But to, to me, the 
effort, like all such endeavours, is one that comes back to the translational aspects of it. How, how do you actually communicate the value of this stuff to people um, outside of culture where such music is seen as embedded and normal and taken for granted? And, um, you know, people understand how to interact with it because they've been doing that ever since they could walk. Um, mm. I can remember the very first rehearsals you had with um, the young Wagalak group, the Wilfreds mm -hmm. at Mokor. And I can remember that, you know, people in the Australian Art Orchestra were trying to elicit some sort of free form, um, you know, improvisatory outcome. And the Wilfreds kept on insisting, no, actually, we're just going to teach you Manike. And we don't really care if your instruments aren't part of the Manike tradition or not. We're going to teach you our Manike regardless. And yeah. you're just going to learn how to play our Manike on the instruments that you have. <laughs> and yeah. I'd actually never seen that before, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, that yeah. was the first time I'd seen that. And there was, al there, there was al almost this sort of obstinate insistence that, yeah, we're going to share this with you. Yeah. No matter what, because a it's our obligation to do so, yeah, and and b we're going to subvert your notions about what you're here to do by teaching you um, a tradition that very few people on earth uh, are, are trained in. And and I well, I thought that was <clears throat> extraordinary. <laughs> Look, it was the whole thing was extraordinary. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, uh, when I first went there on my first visit, before I went back with the Art Orchestra and Archie and Ruby. Um, I had a very interesting exchange mm. with uh, with Benjamin and Roy. Yeah. And I said, look, I'm here essentially to learn from you about your music if, if you are willing to do that. Uh, and then I began to explain a little bit about what I did. And I'd recently made a recording in New York and I played them a little bit of the music just to give them a kind of a sense of, where I was coming from. And then Benjamin said, oh, I've been to New York. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, okay. So that that's just, you know, don't assume anything, right? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's the first, within a second, I'm going, my brain's going, just park all your assumptions at the door. Forget anything you might think you know, because you know nothing. You know nothing. So go back to that point of knowing of, of the nothingness, of the knowing of nothing. So um, when, I, when it became clear that this was not a kind of a, um, a sort of a cultural raid that I was trying to, you know, to impose, that I was, I was wanting to grab something from them and, you know, make it my own and yet again another rehearsal of some sort of colonialist paradigm um i think that they they said look you know one thing they made very clear to me and i think um but might have been kevin who said this to me but he said you know oh, you've got to understand this ballon are coming into our communities all the time and they they're going to do this and they're going to do that oh we're going to you know we're going to change the world we're going to do this we're going to make something together and then you know we never see them again for dust they mm. just don't come back mm. and so we've learned to be very kind of wary of people coming in saying i want to do this with you that's all very easy for you to say but let's you know i want to see you walk the walk not just you know promise the world and deliver nothing so when we came back with the art orchestra there they there we were and we were there to learn there was no doubt that that was why we were there, sitting under the tree uh, outside the Women's Centre at Nuka. And there was a lot of hesitancy among certain of the band because they felt they weren't sure, you know. Uh, it was that thing about what are we and what are we not allowed to do here. Mm -hmm. And it took them a while to kind of settle in to the fact that they were, and they had to get used to this, the students, they were being taught. Mm. And that's how it was. And you're absolutely right. They were really 
at very serious and quite hardcore about just learn these melodies mm. and get them right. Mm. Haven't you got it yet? You know, they'd show a, a degree of impatience if we didn't get it, if we did, weren't picking it up fast enough. It was very, you know, very similar to situations I've had working with master musicians from South India or, mm. you know, musicians from the jazz tradition. They expect you to learn and give it your full attention and pay attention, right? The other really important part of all of this was the grandfather relationship because Jambu Bura Bura was still alive at that yes, time. Yes. And he was the owner. So he was the repository of the of this particular devil devil dreaming and and you know the, the songs that were associated with that. And one day he came to watch this. And I thought, okay, this is, you know, this is the great man. He's now here. I think whatever happens at this point will be fairly decisive in whether or not this entire project proceeds or not. And no sooner was he there than I looked up and, and he was gone. He sort of appeared and then he disappeared. I thought, okay, well, that can't be great. And then at the end of our visit, we did the concert, Ruby's story, mm. for the community with Archie and Ruby. And they insisted, the Wilfreds insisted, that we had to open the concert with a kind of a show and tell of what we'd learned in our few days of studying Manukau with them. So we actually had to perform it for the community. So, all right, we kind of... Uh, we we agreed we we begged their indulgence because we was we still felt that we were fairly green and, and not match fit for this kind of thing but nevertheless we did it and the really one of these kind of incredible lightning moments for me was uh we're playing away so i would suggest stumbling our way through the manicay and still trying to get a handle on the structure of it and then i look over and there is the grandfather, Jambu. He's joined them singing along with us. Do you remember that, Aaron? He, he joined us on stage for that for that last concert. Mm. And um, that was the moment where I realised, aha, uh -huh, this is going to go forward. Mm. You know, and that sense of um, being allowed in and then patiently you know, working with us until there was an, uh, a sense that we had finally grasped something of the structure of this music in a way that we could then as a group move forward. That started to take root in all of our minds and imaginations. And then over the years that followed, and it was a slow process, uh, my own understanding of what I mentioned before about the kind of philosophical universality of, of the whole kind of proposition around Manike. When I started to get that, then the whole thing just opened wide up for me and to the point where we could actually bring Manike into a conversation with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra, which we did yeah. a couple of years ago which we're doing with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra next year at the Opera House. So, you know, Manike, what the, the work at least that we are doing with Manike is achieving what Manike sets out to be in any case, which is a kind of an expression of bungu, uh, uh, a bringing together of people, a way of conversing, uh, creating a safe environment, um, you know, purification ritual, all of those things. They're all a part of it, as you know. I think what we need is actually to play a little Manakei so that people understand what we're talking about. It's right. a pretty prof profound tradition, isn't it? <laughs>
I, I, I hear what you mean about timing as well. Um, you know, I can remember I was there when the first album was recorded in the studio um, mm. down the beach at Melbourne. And, yeah. uh, you know, a number of takes that had to happen to actually get, you know, the, the timing of cadences right and all of that was mm. actually quite tricky um, because there are moments that can sound freeform for quite a long period of time and then you've suddenly got to snap together. And it's all about having performed with the same people for your entire life. So you just know, don't you? You do. And, 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 and unless unless you've just learned it a few years ago and you don't know that. And, and then well, that's it's tricky. Yeah. It's very tricky. And, you know, uh, speaking of the diversity of the different, even within the Yonyu area, the diversity uh, of, you know, forms of Manike is quite extraordinary. Um, oh, for sure. It's not a centralised system. Every clan, has, no. every clan has their different permutation on what the tradition and the form actually is. Yeah. And it's incredibly complex. Like the relationship between the Yidaki rhythm, the Bilma metrical modes and the melody lines, mm. they work in this incredible kind of lockstep, which is... At the same time, very, very precise and incredibly supple. And when you start to break it down into, you know, a Western way of thinking about subdivisions of, of a beat, it's it's mind-bendingly complex. I mean, and, and it's largely based in prime numbers, I've noticed, too, oh. that the rhythms are in seven, five, you know, the, these are very natural sorts of, uh, of of ways of understanding rhythm. Isn't that interesting? I never thought of that. I can remember seeing some members of the band with their transcriptions of what they'd been playing, and <laughs> yeah. that, that's pretty mind-bending when you actually have to transcribe it using Western notation. Um, it, it looks, oh, I've had to it, transcribe it, it. It looks really complicated. It's really, yeah. really complicated. Yes. In the piece I created for the uh, for the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra with with Daniel and David called Wata, um, I have written Yidaki rhythms to be played, for example, in the in the cellos and basses in the orchestra, doing those leaps, the Yidaki leaps between the fundamental and the harmonic, which is such a kind of a that that's why you know we understand the Yidaki as being a drum. It's not really it's it's not a drone, as which is the kind of popular myth about the didgeridoo. Yeah. Well, um, it can be played that way, of course. You can make a drone sound in it. But the way that it's used in Manike is it's a drum played with the mouth. Yeah, it's 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 almost precisely like the kinds mm. of rhythms you'd find in Indonesian drums. Yeah. yeah. Or or Indian, like the Mridangan yeah. in South Indian music is, is the low note and the high note. Yeah. Quite similar. Anyway, writing those things out for you know for symphonic string players, yeah, it was it was challenging. But so, you know, because it's great natural music. Of course, once you get it, and once you feel it, it's 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 supposed to be played like that. And once once you're it's in your body, it feels not quite natural and normal. Hmm. Well, look, I think that's that's all fascinating and, and we don't really have enough time to talk through that in any immense detail today. But I think, you know, considering that this show is no doubt going to continue into the future, let, let's undertake to get back together and talk about it in a future episode. But I guess um, considering where we're at um, in Australia today, um, we wondered if you also wanted to talk about the voice and the current referendum that's facing us um on october 14 given your many travels um yep. across different parts of the world and two different parts of the world um with indigenous musicians and artists mm. um how are you feeling about that at the moment well i feel uh an immense sense of uh, necessity for the voice. Yes. Um, that's the first thing I would say. Um, not surprisingly, um, you know, there's a lot of disinformation on the no side, which is 
about destabilizing. Uh, I think it's a great shame that it became uh, a politicized event, by which I mean that it's not bipartisan. If it had been bipartisan from the day one, then we wouldn't be in the situation that we are in now. Uh, because I think that, you know, good sense would suggest that there is nothing about the voice which is in any way a bad idea. Hmm. The fact that people are suggesting that there are this or that aspect of it, which are either unnecessary or, you know, wastage, is just simply the result of, of bad information being circulated by people who, for their own either party political reasons or other possibly darker reasons, would like to see the thing scuttled. I mean, for me, as, a, as an artist, it's a kind of a, you know, the role that we as artists have in this country called Australia rests on the on the backs of you know tens of thousands of years of art making practice in in an infinite number of different variations in this place so the idea that we're, we're voting about representation in order to make you know recommendations to to our elected officials seems such a no-brainer to me and I think to the large, you know, the vast majority of people working in the arts in Australia, I don't think there's a single person I've ever spoken to who has another view about this. No, me neither. Um, you know, the arts and artists in Australia, no matter who they are, have been at the forefront of these sorts of campaigns for basic human rights for Indigenous Australians for a very long time, I would imagine the whole of the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it really, really seems to me that um, the situation we find ourselves in has been, yes, it's been, it's been let down by, I guess, um, you know, the partisan nature of politics. Yeah, well, it's terrible that it's become a political football. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that, that should never have been the case. Look, I've said this before and I'll say it again. The yes vote, the establishment of a voice to parliament, will make us a better nation, a healthier nation. Things that can help us to understand uh, the, the, the history of Australia, uh, the struggle of our First Nations peoples, the, the, uh, the, their needs, the importance of the role that they can play in the future of, of this place uh, and of our understanding of its history. In order to be able to be a healthier polis, we need to have these reforms. Hmm. It's a way of moving forward. It's a way of growing up as a country. If we continue to deny ourselves these opportunities, uh, we will remain a kind of a, you know, I would say, a pimply teenager amongst the world's more grown-up communities. And it's very, very important that, that we do this uh, for our own collective well-being. It is true. The most mature countries are the ones that have dealt with their past, and aren't they? They are. Mm. And we <laughs> are not very good at dealing with our past. Uh, as we all know, there are people who refer to the black armband view of history. Well, you know, that's all very well and good, but you can't deny the facts. And uh, it's more important that we stare reality in the face, understand our history and learn how it is that we got to where we are than to make up some sort of fable about it. Hmm. I, it's occurred to me, uh, Paul, that uh, some of the things being said during the course of this referendum debate uh, are so astonishingly false and ugly that it's, uh, 
difficult to think of uh, another democracy uh, where, uh, uh, apart from the United States of America, of course, where debates about, uh, you know, the issues of um, the place of the First Peoples uh, and and related historical matters and, and the, you know, the resonance in the present uh, could be had in such a foul way as the present debate. I mean, you've travelled widely. I mean, I, imagine... Ha- Conducting the debate like this in, say, Cambodia or mm. Rwanda, I mean, you'd, you'd be thrown out of the country, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that your experience of being in the world? Yes, it is. I mean, look, you know, First Nations pe- peoples are fighting battles all over the world. We, we know that. Uh, you just need to look at a place like Brazil, where their habitat is being threatened on a daily basis. Um, and again, you know, a nation in which this rich diversity of First Nations peoples is a very important part of, of their heritage and, and of their lived experience and ongoing and future experience. So no, it's, it's not uh, particularly unique to Australia that it is a, an issue like it is here. But the nature of the debate, Marcia, you're absolutely right about that. You know, the old skeletons, uh, the old, the monsters uh, of, and and call it what it is, of racism, uh, you know, the dogs have been let off the leash. And they're running around, you know, spreading their their malevolent uh, misinformation. Um, And, you know, they are influencing the minds of people who really are ill-informed, people who don't know people who might be on the fence um, and they're getting yapped at by, you know, by these ideas and and, and false notions that are circulating. And it, it ends up having a, a very uh, negative effect, kind of a negative net effect. Um, it, I find it very frustrating and I worry about Australia's international reputation. If mm. the yes boat goes down, then... How does it make us look in the world? It's it's so kind of obviously, you know, non-threatening and only positive in terms of what it's setting out to be that it can't help but look like another form of, um, of you know, destabilisation of, 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 um, of racial prejudice, which is being foisted on the community. I just can't see it being interpreted in another way by the vast majority of onlookers overseas. Yeah, in fact, it's a kind of legitimation of racism on a grand scale, should the referendum fail, I think. Uh, And I'm also worried about what we do in the future. I mean, one thing we've learnt during this referendum campaign is how the vast majority of Australians know almost nothing about Aboriginal people that's accurate. And as that is why it is so easy for Peter Dutton and, you know, these other characters to tell such astonishing lies and and they're believed uh, yeah. because people know nothing. And yet here you've devoted your life to the musical traditions, not only of your own culture and, and you know, uh, through the Australian Art Orchestra and, and your work at, uh, at Monash, but also with Indigenous performers and, and, and many people like you, Samuel Kirkpatrick, uh, who worked with you, his book Singing Bones, and Aaron Korn and his uh, books and work on the National Recording Program for Indigenous Performance. We're all trying to preserve these great traditions. And as you mm. said right at the very beginning, you know, you yourself didn't know that these musical traditions existed. And here we are you know, decades later, still trying to preserve them and we realise that most Australians don't know much at all about the First Peoples and what a challenge we have have ahead of us. And we thought thought we'd done a good job. How extraordinary. these These are treasures. We're talking about treasures of world significance. These are not just 
you know, the found objects of some lost civilization. We're talking about living, breathing traditions which go back tens of thousands of years, which lead us, they link us with immediacy to the remote past and point towards a future of great benefit globally. And we can ill afford to ignore these things. We are, we are, we'll be much better off as so-called Australians if we understand who the original inhabitants of this place were and what their belief systems were, how they managed to live in such difficult circumstances in complete harmony and happiness, it would seem, more or less, over such a, an extended period of time. What can we learn from that? How can we afford not to learn from that? You know, look at the damage we've done just from a, a purely ecological point of view in the short amount of time we've been here. Mm. How can we possibly afford not to take on board the vast tracts of knowledge in so many different areas that our original inhabitants, our first peoples, cultivated over such a long time? Mm. In, in every area, I'm not just talking about the arts, talking about, you know, cultivation of land, of you know, understanding seasonal change, uh, health. It goes on. Um, I think we're nearly at time. Um, and look, all of that's fascinating. And once again, let's get together again soon to talk more about those issues because they are desperately important. But um, to close out, for anybody who is genuinely undecided or not knowing what to do on the 14th of October when the referendum is held. Um, is there anything that you'd like to say to those people before we start off would, today? I would say if, if you are worried about this, if you are still going to be standing in the, in the queue on the 14th of October, not sure which way to go, I would say look around you, look at the people around you, and remember that you're a citizen of a place. And with citizenship comes responsibility. If you're proud to be an Australian person, if that idea is important to you, then think about the tens of thousands of years of history which preceded the arrival of Europeans as colonisers in this place. And think about the immense uh, privilege that we all have to be in this place uh, which was lived in by these people for such a long time and our responsibility to those people to protect that legacy uh, within the laws of the land not that it becomes something which can be changed as political fortunes wax and wane but that it is established in a way which cannot be easily shifted, that there is a mechanism through which the knowledge and aspirations of our first peoples can be heard. Because the history of this country suggests that we have been unable to listen to these people properly. And this mechanism will give us a way to listen. That I think is worth considering. Thank you so much, Paul. Absolutely. Pleasure, privilege, thank you.